starting off in just a moment. My, my grandpa ran a PX at that fort you're talking about uh, in Missouri. It's called Fort Leonard Wood. And, and the soldiers there called it Fort Lost in the Woods. I don't know why that just tickled me that they called it that. But, uh, we are, let's see, Esther chapter 9, verse 20. Uh, let's jump in and read that, and then we'll kind of get into the introduction of this. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent a letter unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both nigh and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same yearly. And the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day. And they, they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. And the Jews undertook to do as they had begun and as Mordecai had written unto them, because Haman the son of Hamadat the Agai, the enemy of the Jews, had devised against the Jews to destroy them and cast purpur, which is a lot, to consume them and to destroy them. And when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that this wicked device which he devised against the Jews should return upon his own head, and that he and his son should be hanged upon the gallows, whereupon they called these days Purim, after the days of Pur. Uh, therefore, uh, therefore all the words of this letter of that day which had been uh, seen concerning the matter and which had come unto them, and the Jews ordained, and, and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as, as joined themselves unto them so that it should not fail. And they would keep <coughs> these two days according to their writing, according to their appointed time every year. And that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city. And that these days of Purim should not fail among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. And as for the queen, the daughter of Abihail and, and Mordecai, the Jew, wrote with all authority to confirm the second letter of Purim. And he sent the letters unto all the Jews in the 127 provinces of the king, kingdom of Ahasuerus with the words peace and truth. And to confirm the days of Purim in their times appointed, according to Mordecai the Jew and Esther the queen, had enjoined them. And as they had decreed for themselves and for their seed the matters of the fastings of their cities. And the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim as it was written in the book. Now we're going to be talking about remembering. Think, remembering those key things, those times of deliverance that God has given us. We, we use things, certain things to remember. Now one of them is kind of photographs. One, I was listening to one guy talk about how he said... He said, this next generation of old people, the people, the young right now are going to be old later, are going to be the worst old people ever. He said, here's why. He said, here's why. He said, if you talk to an old person now, you go up to them and you talk to them, they've got a story, man. I mean, like he said, they'll show you, if they're going to show you a picture, they'll say, and this is a picture of me standing by Charles Lindbergh before his transatlantic flight, you know, and he said, they've got a good story. He goes, when these guys are old people, you're going to go through their phone and they're going to swipe their phone and go, this was a breakfast I had on one day. Uh, this, was, this was a dress I was thinking about buying. <laughs> he said he went through all the dumb stuff they take pictures of now. Digital photography has ruined photography. I don't know why. Because if everything is photograph worthy, nothing is photograph worthy. If you try to remember every single event, then nothing is really memorable at all. You understand what I mean? So that like when I... There exists of me before I'm 18 years old, I bet less than 20 pictures. I mean, there's just not a lot. Because I came from the day when they actually had photographs, and it was on film. Do you remember that? You'd, you'd take the pictures, and then you'd send it off somewhere for months at a time, and, and you'd, all of a sudden, one day in the mail, you'd get you'd get a package of, of uh, pictures, and you had no idea what was on it. You couldn't even remember when you took the pictures, man. And, and so, and, and my mom, bless her heart, had, had started out with kind of a, a memorial book, kind of a, you know, this is Jean. And it's only got, I don't know, maybe maybe 10 pages in it. And, and some of those are report cards where the teacher is saying, Gene's a nice boy, but he's not very bright. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I appear to just 
discombobulation was something I really started early. And uh, but so there's it, there's just very limited stuff that's there. Uh, but now now everything's kind of gone digital. Here's an idea: if you and now they don't they no longer sort of print out the pictures very much and put them into books, so you don't have that physical memorial. But one of the things you can do digitally, if you are taking a lot of those pictures and you want to remember, make sort of a way of remembering for your children and grandchildren, one of the things you can do is set up a like a Gmail account for them when they're born, and then as key events come and you take pictures, you can upload those pictures to an email, send that, send an email to that email address, then when they're 18, you can turn that email over to them and they have sort of a chronicle, they have sort of a, a digital photo album that they can go by and a digital sort of memory of those things. But memory, remembering is absolutely essential. What, what do we say about history? Those who don't know history are repeated. repeated. Right. And, and so the re there's a reason that God has a memorial for, say, Passover and for Purim. And so we're going to be digging into that. So in Esther, Esther 9.28 says, These days should be remembered and observed in every generation, by every family, in every province, and in every city. Now, now God's pattern of memory, memory has to go back to, say, Passover. And in Exodus 12, as they institute the Passover, they're delivered out from under the hand of a wicked Pharaoh that knew not God and didn't remember Joseph or God and decided to make them slaves. And he was put them hard by, and they were not only making bricks, but they were growing the straw to make the bricks with, and he was using their labor. He was killing their children, and they experienced a supernatural deliverance of God that was really unparalleled in human history. And so God did not want them to forget that joy that they experienced. As they, as they get on the other side of the Red Sea, there's this celebration where, I mean, the women break out tambourines and start dancing and singing. And they're, they're singing about how God had, had destroyed the, the horse and his rider and the sea and how God had delivered them. But God did not want them to forget that deliverance. And so he established Passover as a yearly commemoration of the deliverance of the children of Israel out of slavery and bondage and oppression and where they're finally set free. And then here Purim is established, another one of the, the holidays and holy days that they celebrate within Judaism. And it remembers this genocidal uh, plot that was foiled and how God intervened on behalf of those people. And by the way, I believe that God has intervened on behalf of his people again after the attack that took place in early October uh, last year, the year before. And, and uh, did you hear that the, the court is, is going after Netanyahu and I think is mm -hmm. Secretary of Defense, I can't remember what their version of that is, but they've issued a warrant for his arrest for defending his people. <laughs> That is ridiculous. Uh, I, anyway, that's that's not part of this, but it's but, but that but that that mindset is still there. That that that, that uh, uh, genocidal hatred for Judaism and the people of God is still a thing. And then we, but you know, on that point, just to show you how stupid yeah the whole thing is, they issued a warrant for the Hamas leader. Who's been dead for right? Yes, yeah, so, so it costs them nothing. It's just a piece of paper to say that. Yeah, yeah, I don't think he hears very much. Right? He's he's answered to a higher court. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, and then, of course, we have in Christianity communion. We celebrate that, remembering Christ's sacrifice on the cross for us, where His body was broken for us, His blood was shed for us, and we remember that regularly, so so that we don't forget how we were delivered in the spiritual realm. Now, there are a lot of ways that uh, that <coughs> memorial took place that God used. For, uh, for p the people of God to remember. One of them actually was the geography of the land. So Mount Sinai meant something to the children of Israel. That mountain was the mountain of God, the mountain of the Lord, it says. It's where the law was given. You might think of Mount Moriah in Genesis 22, which a lot of scholars believe is actually Mount Calvary in the New Testament where, uh, where the God brought, God made himself a sacrifice for us. And then there was a couple of other mountains in the Old Testament where blessings were read from one mountain and cursings read from another from the law. And God was using that as a PowerPoint illustration for them to remember the law. Or some of the other ways that God would have, uh, have them remember things. Um, 
He, he would have memorials that were built. So after the children of Israel had crossed over the Jordan River by God supernaturally stopping up the flow of the river and they marched across similar to the Red Sea crossing, God had them gather some large stones from out of the the riverbed of the Jordan and on the other side they built an altar out of those 12 stones and he said he said your kids are going to say what mean these stones and then you're going to tell them and so he was setting up an intentional reminder of the deliverance of God and the goodness of God um, of course the law itself was a, was a memorial to God if you when I was in Jerusalem we were at the the wailing wall and there you will see some, some men, Hasidic Jews with the four locks, the, all, dressed all in black. When you first go there, you think they're Amish because you're, you know, if you're from America. But they're, the Hasidic Jews, they wear black and, and, they, and they're, they're sitting at kind of a desk and they're, they're rocking and they're, they've, got a, they've got a scroll or book or scroll open in front of them and they're, they're working on memorizing and quoting the word of God, and, and it's, a, it, it's a memorial. They remember, and, and in Judaism, the children would memorize these first five books of the Bible. They'd memorize the entirety of it because God wants us to remember. And, and then, then another, another way, of course, with these feasts and festivals, the, these high and holy days that took place throughout the entirety of the year, and a lot of them were gathering conclaves where people were gathered together to the the nation's capital into the temple, and they would worship God there. And, and others were were uh, were where they would build uh, uh, booths or almost temporary dwellings. There are all kinds of ways. But throughout the year, the Israelites were regularly reminded of the deliverance and goodness of God. And so, if that's true that all of these things are there and they're enjoined to remember the goodness and deliverance of God, do you think God all of a sudden stopped caring if we remember? I think he probably still expects us to remember his goodness and his deliverance. And so we need to somehow build that into our lives as well, which maybe this Advent calendar maybe is a fascinating way to think through that. I, I was, I not, wasn't as, I've heard of an Advent calendar. I just didn't know what it was and how it played out. Because we're in the, in the Baptist denomination that I came from, we're more, more free form of that. Of course, we remember Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving and those kind of things. But, but I was fascinated by how it was structured. I'd never seen it. I thought that was kind of interesting how there was key points and church, reminders. Church calendar. Church calendar, yeah, yeah, through, through the year. Uh, and, yeah, I said Advent calendar, didn't I? A church calendar throughout the entirety of the year. That calendar, I think, has That's chocolate. That's short. Chocolate every day. Yes, chocolate. It's, it's chocolate. It's, uh, yeah. You know, some of those Advent calendars come broken because you, by the third day, you've already ate all the chocolate out of them. So, yeah. <laughs> so, sir. That's not part of this. I, I, see, I told you I just combobulated. Um, so, so, so throughout the Old Testament, God is inviting Israel to remember. Now, here's the power of celebration, verse 22. And as the days were the Jews rested from their enemies in the month, which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy. There should be no more joyful people on the planet than Christians. Amen. I mean, just, I, I don't know how else to say that. We, now, that doesn't mean that we don't have our times. We do. It doesn't mean we don't go through grief because we do. But we sorrow not as others which have no hope. And, and even the, the grief and, and sorrow that we have, we have a joy that counterbalances that. You know, and, and so we have to become a joyful people in these last days. I don't know that it's going to be an, a, a brilliant apologetic that's going to win this generation. I think it's joy-filled Christians that are going to win this generation. Because we have to show them that we have something they don't have. We have hope they don't have. We have heaven to look forward to. Look, on, on our hard days, we can, we can sing this world is not my own. I'm just a passing through. We can think about where we're going. They don't have that. In their mind, this is all they have. And so if we don't flesh out this joy and celebration, I think we're doing a disservice to our evangelism because we're not going to reach the world if we look. You know, I told you before, probably last week even, Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of the greatest jurists in American history, he said when he was younger, he wanted to be a preacher, but they all look like undertakers. And so he, <laughs> so, so he, so he, he said, nope, I'm not interested in that. He was a great Christian, but he didn't become a pastor. Who, you know, who knows, did God, I, I don't know how God delivered of it, but I, I think he has a legitimate complaint against us. 
Um, so this power of celebration, there, the elements of the celebration that are here and, and uh, to this Purim is there was a feasting together. Like we have a Thanksgiving, it's coming up in a couple of days. We're going to gather together and there's a feasting that takes place together. There's something about food and family and friends that is just restorative. I mean, you know, it's, and as you get our age, you know, some people, even Christmas for me, Christmas is more about the family getting together than it is any gifts. I mean, you, know, you get to our age, you get to our age, first of all, there's not much that we need. You know, we, we kind of, and whatever we need, we've actually made enough money to actually buy ourselves. And so it's not, it's not so much about that. But when you get the family together and you look down that table, in my case, it's a long table. But you look down that table, and you see those faces, and you look at what God's doing, and it does something for your heart. And so there's this feasting that was there. And then there was a giving to others. So they, they were to send portions to this person, to that person, and they were thinking, that, I'm thinking about you. I care about you. I love you. So there was, a, there was an element of interconnecting the, the people of God together by this, this giving and receiving of gifts that sort of tied them together in a special way. And, and in this giving to others, you were to find people that didn't have so that you could help them to have. The people that had need, so that you can meet that. Which I love your idea about bringing food for, the, for, the, uh, for mustard seed so, so that our gathering together actually helps other people to have that. I, I think that's such a God-like thing, a, a godly thing to do. And, and there was just communal joy. There, were, there was a, where the people that were together, they were celebrating together. I, I, I love the, our, our church. We have this, uh, you know, this ability to enter in to the joy that's there. And we, uh, I, I like, I like churches that say amen and 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 s sort of celebrate from the congregation as well. Mm -hmm. I, I know probably in some of the high church tradition, it'd blow their minds if you said amen in the middle of a sermon, but. But I, I, I like that because I've always enjoyed that when, when you're preaching and there's especially when there's a sense of celebration, like 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 Val was talking about being the king, Jesus is the king. That's a reason to celebrate, man. We have a king. And so if we, we, we should be able to say amen to that, or praise the Lord to that, or hallelujah to that. And that's a communal celebration. Because sometimes if you're ever in one of those services where you can tell the preacher celebrating, but then you're looking around at other people that are there. And you look like, man, they were baptizing lemon juice or something. What, what happened? That was beautiful. They, he's celebrating, but they're not celebrating. Why are they not celebrating? Whatever he's happy about, they're not happy about. You know, that's not good. So he talks about a communal joy that was supposed to take place there. And then there were shared stories. I, I think we need to share our stories, especially stories of deliverance. And we'll kind of get, we'll get more into that as we make our way through. Uh, the thing about Thanksgiving dinner, it's not just about the food. Now, the food is excellent. My, my wife is a good cook. Man, she's good. And, I, and Thanksgiving is still, oh man, my stomach celebrates at Thanksgiving, but it's more than, it's more than about the food. I mean, it, we love that, but it's about that being able to share stories around that table and to make traditions and to keep those traditions. And it's the, one of the things that I worry about in, in our current culture. Because we're so spread out, I think we can, if we're not careful, we can lose some of those traditions. You know what I mean? Now, when you guys were younger, um, it was less common for people to move as much as they do now. It just was. So, so probably some of you grew up even on farms where you might have had a multi-generational home within the same house. You might have had a grandma and grandpa, mom and a dad, and then their children. So you might have had multiple generations within the same house. It was much easier then to pass along those traditions down the family line than it is now for us. Because now, one of my daughters is in Tennessee. You know, and so you, you have family now that moves. And, and, and if we're not careful, we can lose the traditions. And we can't afford to lose the traditions. And I know there's some that, you know, that they, they, because they don't understand what we're talking about here, they almost want to do away with tradition. They're almost anti-tradition. That is wrong. I mean, I, I don't know how else to say it. It is wrong. You are robbing yourself of, of, the, of the learnings and understandings of the others that have come before you. See, I'm smart enough to know that everything in my life, every good thing in my life, I'm standing on the shoulders of people that went before me. 
You understand what I mean? So the good, the good things that are in my life, I got because there were some people that sacrificed when I was a kid and even before I was born so that I could have what I have, know what I know, and be who I am. And if I, and if I forget that, if I allow those traditions to slip away and to mean nothing, I do, in my opinion, I'm insulting those lives that went before. I'm insulting that. And, and I think somehow in this current culture, there's a, it, it's almost a cult of the new and a cult of the young. You know, so if it's new, it's good. You know, it's a new thing. Um, there's a whole lot of new stuff that's trash. It's no good. And, and, the, and not just because something is young, is it good? So that one of the things that I found, I love talking, I, I visit with shut-ins and those are in nursing facilities once a month. And one of the things that, that I've learned is when I begin to, to talk to them about their lives, man, they have done some living and God has taught them some things. And you will, you will, I, I have just sat there just gobsmacked by what God has done in that person's life. And had I not talked to them, that story would have died with them. You, you know what I mean? And so we have to be in places gathered together like Thanksgiving, like Christmas, like Easter. And, and, and the Jews had their celebrations so that we can share those stories. And, and remember what, what a past generation did and how they handled their hard times. And then the practice of remembrance in verse 27. The Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon, and upon all such as joined themselves unto them. They were gathering together to remember. There was a, in order to remember something, there has to be, and, and this was instituted yearly. So there has to be a regular rehearsal. So we, we do it again and again, which is what we do with Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter. An intentional inclusion where we're drawing people in. One of the things that's good if you're having like a Thanksgiving dinner is invite somebody that doesn't have anybody. There's, that we all know somebody that is maybe older and maybe all of their friends and family are gone. And maybe we bring them into our home during a Thanksgiving thing. You understand what I mean? Or, or somebody that doesn't have much is a powerful way to include them and, and to, to inculcate this Thanksgiving and whatever it is that we're celebrating within the particular Christian holiday that we celebrate. And then there's this generational transfer. I think of it as a passing of a baton. I, I've always loved the relay races and track because you're, the, the one runner runs their race as hard as they can. And then they've got the baton in their hand and they hand it off to the next runner. If the first runner decided at the end of his race, I'm just going to keep the baton, and when he stops, you lost the race. You, you, your job is to pass the baton, and that's, that's what our generation needs to understand, is you serve a vital purpose with this next generation. You serve the purpose of passing a baton on to them. So a lot of things you and I are not able to do because of physical infirmity, advancements in age, those kind of things. But what we can do is pass the baton on to that next generation, encourage them, bless them, uh, pray for them, uh, tell them our stories so that they can take the baton on as well. So the relay race of faith continues. So from the commentary, it says, more than reminiscing, celebrating the works of God continues to root us in our true identity as God's holy people. It, it, we teach them who we are and who they are. Because they don't know. You've heard, you've heard young people, I'm just trying to find myself. It was big, it was big, it was big when I was younger. You'd have you'd have people, this hippie generation, I don't know what happened to them, but they lost themselves a lot. They, they, they could not find themselves. I've always been able to look in a mirror and find myself pretty well, but somehow they have a problem with it. They go, I just need to go find myself. And they, they go off and do the stupidest, wickedest things. You're like, buddy, what is wrong with you? You know? And, but so you and I, because we've asked and answered those questions, we under, I understand my identity in Christ. There's a lot of stuff I don't understand. I do understand that. I, I know that I've been saved by the grace of God. I'm kept by the power of God. Amen. I'm washed over by an awesome God. I'm infilled with the Spirit of God. I know who I am and I know whose I am. That's what we're talking about in there. I know who I am and I know whose I am. I need to be passing that along to the next generation. 
I need to communicate that to the young people so that they don't spend their time chasing after drugs and alcohol and all the stuff that the world tries to push off on them so that they can get that. It's a powerful thing. Um, and when we, when we rehearse something, we do it again and again, it creates kind of a spiritual muscle memory. You, you guys know what muscle memory is, right? You, how, how many pianists are here? Raise your hand if you're, you're a piano player. I'm not going to ask you to play me. I just want to play. <laughs> what is he going to do now? We, we heard him sing before. That was terrible. Now what's he going to do? Um, when you learn to play, one of the things that you, that you do when you practice a song enough is you develop a muscle memory in your hands. You develop a memory of, of how, where the keys are so that you, because if you didn't, you, you would, you, your brain would almost explode because you're trying to read the notes on the page in front of you, then you're trying to look down at one hand that's playing the bass, the other hand that's playing the melody, and, and so you, your mind would explode if you didn't teach your hands muscle memory. David talked about that with war. He said that his hands, that God, God had skilled his hands for war. When somebody swung a sword at David, his hand automatically knew how to block it. If you've ever seen a, somebody that's been in a lot of fights, when somebody swings, they know how to duck. Because their their body knows what's going on even before their brain know, knows what's going on. And, and how fast some of that stuff takes place, you have to have muscle memory. And how is muscle memory developed? Practice, practice, practice. The guy gets in the, gets in the back of the taxi cab. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, 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 the taxi cab driver says. That's how you develop spiritual muscle memory as well. Our first response to situations should involve thanksgiving instead of moaning. You know what I mean? Uh, sometimes, if we're not careful, we'll wake up in the morning and your body hurts. You know, I mean, I know now, now you're painfully aware of where all of your joints are, and you, you could, you, you're aware of where they are with your eyes closed because you can feel all of them in the morning. And so, if you're not careful, you can wake up and, and you, oh man, another day, and it hurts. But you might not have woke up. You, you know, I mean, you might not have. You, your name might have been in the obituaries today instead of instead of staggering in to get your uh, folders today. I saw the Johnny Carson show a long time ago, and they had an old movie roustabout guy. He was on the movie set. He said he was just back and forth and back and forth. Hardly ever quit. Johnny Carson asked him a secret. And the guy said, well, first thing in the morning when I wake up, I stretch my arms way up and wiggle my fingers. Yeah. Stretch my toes way out and wiggle them. And thank God I'm not in a pine box. Praise <laughs> God. Yeah. Yeah. We have so much to be thankful for. I, some, sometimes people ask me how I'm doing, and I'll say, it's a great day. I, and then I'll, I'll, I'll add, any day that I can swing my legs over yeah. the edge of the bed, it's a great day. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, they're, and I'm not, I'm not being Pollyanna-ish. You know, I understand there are bad things. There are bad things happen in my life. Hard things happen in my life all the time, but God has given me life. That's, that's not nothing. You know, and I think sometimes we, we don't recognize what we have until we've lost it. And so we need to develop a muscle memory of thanksgiving. Let's make some application of this. We need to create memory makers. Um, we, have, we have thousands of pictures, but which ones really matter? We need to sort through and think through what are what are important things that I want to pass on to the next generation, and how do I want to do that? I don't think it's just only about Thanksgiving and Christmas, but what if what if you, as a grandparent, took your grandchild out fishing? You know, and, and you did that with the intention of kind of communicating some important things to them and spending some time with them, and you're creating memories in doing that. Or, or what if you? You know, what if you uh, had some special traditions that you do for the family for Thanksgiving and you included your daughters and, and your granddaughters in that, in that event and how that plays out? You know, you're inviting them in to this important thing. And I think that we need to be creating th these memories. So first of all, identify key moments of God's intervention. How has God delivered you in your life? I mean, I, I understand how God delivered me. I, I come from my... Dad, my father, my brother, and my uncle were paranoid schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. So they had they had battled mental illness all their lives. 
My grandfather and my father were alcoholics, one a binge drinker and one a daily drinker every day. And so I know that had salvation not taken place in Gene Kissinger's life, I understand where I'd be. I, I got it. I, you know, I, I don't need a crystal ball to figure that out. I, I'd live in the bottom of a bottle till I die. And, and I thank God for that. I mean, I, I thank God for that every day so that I, I, can, I, I can walk by the wine section or the beer section of the store and it don't bother me because I understand the devil lives in those bottles, you know? I mean, I, I, I know that hyperbole, but I, 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 so I, I understand where I've been delivered from. And so when, when I, I have a message that I can try to communicate down to this next generation or, or, and create tangible reminders in some way, whether it's a, whether it's a gathering together and a, and a celebration or whether it's just a communication. My, my grandma had a, a habit with her grandkids. Every grandkid that my grandma had that was old enough to talk and, and old enough to understand, she, she would make sure you knew Jesus. She would go for a walk with you, and with that walk with you, she would talk to you about your relationship with God and whether you had one. Now, my, my, my grandma wasn't a, like an articulate speaker, but she certainly, uh, you could tell by what she was saying, she cared about where you spent eternity. You know, and, and so, now fortunately, when me and grandma had that walk, I'd already been saved. I got saved at the Southern Baptist Church when I was seven, was baptized there, it was a real deal. Um, and so I could honestly tell her I was already saved. But the other kids, she was gonna make sure. And so so the, the walk with grandma around the 15 acres was a way that she was creating a memory and passing the baton. And so we need to find some way to do those things. Now right now, <clears throat> with uh, Christopher, he, he's my grandson that is in uh, Tennessee. And I read stories to him, right, probably two, three times a week, I'll read a story online. And they're just simple, they're simple stories. I pray with him every time I do it. At the end of the story, I pray over his life. So there's a story that he's going to want to hear, and whether he wants to hear the prayer or not, I'm praying over it. And so he's going to grow up, and he's going to have these that he can look back on of when his grandpa read him stories and prayed for him. When his brother gets older, I'm going to set up a page for him, and I'm going to read him stories and pray for him. So you got to find a way to do it. I don't know. I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm saying find a way to do it in your situation where you're inviting people in and you're, you're sharing the deliverance that God has brought into your life. So here, here's some steps of action. Number one, document God's faithfulness. Yet one, of the, one of the reasons we don't know how to create these remembrances is because we don't remember them ourselves. I mean, God, God does deliverances in our lives all the time. But somehow we miss them, or we think, well, that would have just happened. No, that, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. If God delivered you, God did something supernatural for you, write it down some way. Tell somebody about it so that, it, so that it's locked into your mind and their mind. Like, like with this situation with Jordan. Jordan called me from work and he said, man, I, I, need, I, I need to go to the emergency room. Would you take me on? And I didn't even, he, he had been complaining about a pain in his side, but, but he wasn't complaining a lot. So I didn't think it was anything big. I thought maybe it was like a kidney infection or something. We'd go down there. There, they give some antibiotics, they go home. Man, it was, it was his appendix. He'd been experiencing the pain for like a, a week, seven days, which was very unusual. And the doctor said that his appendix was one of the largest ones that, he, that he'd ever seen. And he was surprised that it hadn't burst. And, and I'm thinking, God, because he doesn't have insurance. And so, so he was kind of worried about going down. And I said, buddy, I, I said, you can, you can pay off a, a, a medical bill over time. You know, they, they take payments, but, but you need, you need, it's kind of important not to die, you know? And so we went in, and, and so God supernaturally delivered him, in my opinion, because it would have been very easy to put it off, because the doctor said, how, the doctor was amazing. You must have a high pain tolerance, because you should have been in here, you know, uh, three days after it started, you know? And, and so my point is, how many times has God done something like that for us, and then we just forget about it? We, we don't remember it anymore. We should be, okay, let me think through this with me. Have you ever been around one of those, one of those people that brags on themselves so much they just almost make it awkward? You know, they, you know, well, I'm all this, and I'm all that, I'm wonderful, and I walk on water, I'm the smartest guy ever. And, and you just, you're like, man, that's kind of irritating. Well, if we're going to make something like that awkward, let's brag on God till we make it awkward. 
You know what I mean? So if I'm gonna, if somebody's got to get irritated about me bragging on something, let them get irritated about me bragging on my God. Okay, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Mighty Father God, we do thank you for all that you've done. You spoke and the cosmos left into existence, God. You, you understood that we were marred by sin and you sent a Savior to mend us. God, you, you sent your Spirit to indwell us moment by moment, God. And your Spirit doesn't just exist outside of us, moving on us. He's inside of us day by day so that we're never alone. God, we thank you for all these tremendous truths. Thank you for deliverance of the people of Israel in, in, in this time of Persia. But thank you as well for your deliverance that's taking place right now as you're pushing back the enemies of the people of God. And I pray that you'd protect them, protect Netanyahu, protect those that are under assault from this wicked world system. Just bless our time together. Be with us this weekend in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, by the way, no class Wednesday night. Wednesday night.